here we are. This is the Red Shirt Sophomore 2023-2024 Bowl Game Awards. Clap it up, clap it up, clap it up. All these players, coaches, teams, and games, we thank you for submitting your applications for these awards. We have received them, and we have voted as a team. Now we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten awards to give out. These are some pretty prestigious awards voted on by us. So some of the some two time winner winners were like we didn't agree necessarily on number one, but uh, so we got two winners there, and then uh, we got a couple, a lot of them we both agreed on. So that that's that's pretty nice. So I guess to give you kind of a preview, we got. Best game, worst game, best comeback, biggest what if, best performance on offense, best performance on defense from an individual player, biggest surprise game, could be biggest like upset or biggest you know margin of victory that you were like whoa didn't see that coming, uh, first time starter award for quarterback, uh, best performance in a loss, and best coaching job. Yeah, and like you mentioned earlier in the video, if you guys have any disagreements or you think you missed anybody or who you have your own you know, awards or, or votes you want to give out to, to certain players or teams, let us know in the comments. Absolutely, we'd love to hear from you guys. <clears throat> if you got something wrong, let us know. If you feel like we missed a guy, let us know. If we got something right, let us know as well. We, we love hearing that as well, obviously. But uh, yeah, have fun with it in the comments yourselves. We I know we had a good time reminiscing on the bowl season and, and really going through and you know, trying to highlight some of the best players and teams from these, this bowl season. All right, our first award. We'll switch off reading these off. First award for best bowl game to watch for us. We both agreed that our favorite game to watch was the guaranteed rate bowl, Kansas versus UNLV. You had Jason Bean. You had, first of all, you had 78 total points in that game. Jason mm -hmm. Bean in his last game ever. Came so, back. And by the way, redemption. How about redemption, redemption from a year ago? From the last bowl game. The reason why he came back is because he had a sour taste in his mouth from the end of that bowl game against Arkansas last year. They finished the season nine and four. Is that is that right? Nine and four. Four hundred and forty nine yards thrown, six touchdowns. There were a total of five interceptions also thrown in that game, and uh, thir six touchdowns of over thirty five yards. This is an absolute offensive explosion, and I loved every second of it. So. Any other comments on this game from you? It was awesome, especially to see Jason Bean. At one point, they were kind of running away with it, 21-7, and then UNLV gets a late quarter, late end-of-half field goal, which was very clutch, and then ran a nice two-minute trail to get him in a field goal range, kick a field goal, and then you start the, the comeback the comeback with interception from Jason Bean. Touchdown for UNLV, three and out for Kansas. Touchdown for UNLV, interception for Kansas in their own territory and UNLV looked to be knocking on the door to really be exploiting this game. And Kansas defense got a massive stop. A couple key sacks was massive for it. And then obviously it went touchdown, 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 turnaround down, touchdown, touchdown, turnaround downs. It was awesome. It, it was everything you want in a bowl game, everything you wanted in redemption and coaching and adjustments and big plays. It, it was really awesome to see. It's a late night game. It's when they're playing in the baseball field, Chase Field out in Arizona. And uh, we love staying up late for that to watch that game for sure. That was awesome. I will let you take the worst game. And I'll, I'll let you take it. You know why? Because I, you kind of called it. Yeah. And we, we, we debated, obviously, talking about the Orange Bowl, right? And then nobody really loved to watch that game. And nobody was really interested in that game, I guess. I kind of enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> Georgia minus 20. <laughs> oh, that's true. We had some betters that weren't even sweating it at all at the end there. But. Our worst game here, we're going we're gonna to go to the Boca Raton Bowl. This is USF in Syracuse all the way back in mid-December. We talked about this game. When we previewed it, we were like, no Syracuse quarterbacks. They're probably going to run the option. We have no idea what it's going to look like. USF can really blow them out, or it can be a really close game and be a classic Bull Mania type game. From the first possession, what, you lied about USF? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I could, dude, like, you saw like immediately they were running that whole wildcat BS with the tight end, and you were like, and then USF went down and scored. I'm like, oh, so this is gonna get like really out of hand. I think I got USF at like minus five and a half or something. They opened at plus or sorry, the line closed at plus three and a half, plus three or whatever. 
And so it was like, oh, that was not very good value. If you were watching the game, that was insane value because the final score was 45 to nothing. It was absolute blowout. Great win for Alec Golish. Yeah, it, which, which we talked about. They went 6-6, six and six, made a bowl game, which kind of surprised a couple people. Syracuse, again, limped to the finish line, hence why they needed a new coach. We do think that there are brighter things coming for that program there. For Obviously, sure. Absolutely. Check out, our, check out our Fran Brown video. Not yep. a plug. Absolutely. It's, that's that's in our, our channel as well. We have a bunch of coaching carousel previews. One now we went really in-depth with Fran Brown. But, yeah, I mean, Byron Brown played well. But, or Myron, Mikron White. They didn't even really need them much. It was kind of just Syracuse did nothing offensively. And, and USF just jumped on them 31 nothing in the first half. And it was over, which is why probably made it was our worst bowl game. Yeah, it was it was ugly. It was not even fun to watch actually at all. It was it was a standalone game that night. <laughs> it, it was not fun to watch at all. So I was uh, a little thoroughly disappointed with that. Moving on to the next one, the best comeback. I think a lot of people can guess what this one is, but the best comeback is going to go to the famous Toastery Bulls, Western Kentucky. They won thirty eight to thirty five against Old Dominion. They were down thirty five fourteen in the fourth quarter at half. Or sorry, in the second quarter, they were down 28 to nothing. CD and I both had picked Old Dominion. I look Feeling at that score. Great. I'm watching that game. I'm like, well, it's over. Awesome. Great. Well, Western Kentucky does a little something called turning to their backup quarterback, Hayden Veltkamp, who, by the way, was <laughs> they had asked him to potentially take reps at tight end. Oh, boy. Hayden Veltkamp's in the transport. He's like, let me suit up. Let me go sling the pill for you guys. Yeah, 383 yards, five touchdowns to come back and win that game. That kid just made him a lot, of, made himself a lot of money somewhere. Hopefully, he is a stud. Apparently, apparently he's a stud. I had never heard of the kid. That's that's what bowl games give you though. Like, and we talked about this. Like, some people will say this is a bad bowl season. This is the kind of stuff that makes bowl season great. Guys that come out of absolutely nowhere and just light it up. And that, that is one benefit of the portal. I mean, obviously, it sucks for these teams and these fans and these coaches that lose out on some star players that are going elsewhere or the opt-outs in the bowl games like they had a quarterback, right? Um, but but you have an opportunity for these guys that have waited their turn, grinded on the practice squad, worked their tails off for their whole life to become in this opportunity to play college football on a national stage in standalone games, in prime time, on ESPN, yada, yada, yada. And a guy like Caden Velkem really take, took it and run, ran with it. And that that was awesome. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, there's some honorable mentions, of course. Honorable mentions being like uh, Clemson <laughs> coming back just in that last minute. That was a pretty cool comeback, going down scoring, winning the ball game. You got, I mean, Michigan kind of came back in that fourth quarter there. There are a bunch of games that you could talk about that were, you know, comeback wins that look real nice. And, uh, Boston College, where they were down, they were down, right? Yeah. That, going in that fourth quarter. So a yeah. bunch of games you could talk about. That was, I thought, the clear winner. CD, if you want to get a talk about the biggest what if. Yeah, I, I feel like this is pretty pretty self-explanatory. I'm, we're gonna go with the the orange bowl there with UGA or Georgia and Florida State. Obviously, Florida State was losing a lot more than Georgia did, but obviously to see those teams both at full strength, two teams that really felt they deserved to be in the playoffs. Would have been awesome to get a, a third playoff game. Wouldn't that have been a treat for all of us as fans and coachings and whatnot? And obviously, TV executives will love that as well. But, yeah, it sucks that, that with everything that happened there and the college football calendar and the injuries and yada, 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 it was it was awful. And you kind of saw that as soon as Florida State went you know, on offense in the first quarter. You're like, okay, yeah, th- th- this is going to be bad. And obviously, you knew Carson Beck and the talent they have on offense for Georgia, it got out of hand. And, and, and obviously – it sucks. I feel like this is a pretty easy one. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and we, we don't need to talk too much about it. If anyone wants to argue with this, <laughs> like, oh, the uh, the Ole Miss-Penn State game, I think that's an honorable mention for sure with Penn State's opt-outs. What would they have looked like at full strength, uh, especially on the offensive line, Kalen King, whatever. All right, I, I, this one was clearly number one. I, or, I, I, would, I would throw Oregon State-Notre Dame in there just because there was so much change on both sides. Now, I know it was 40 to 8, similarly to Georgia and Florida State, a very big blowout there. But I do think both those teams at full strength would have been a really good matchup to see how their styles actually, like, it was good on good, you know, for a lot of, for a lot of those teams, yeah. for a lot of those positions, you know. Absolutely. Next one, best performance on offense. Christopher and I disagreed on this one. Uh, 
I'll tell you my vote. I'll tell you his vote. My winner of this was Michael Penix. Best best offensive performance. Here's why. It wasn't just about the stats, because if you want to look at stats, you look at a guy like Jason Bean, you look at Miller Moss, you look at whatever. Michael Penix was ridiculous, avoiding pressures in the biggest stage, diming up his receivers, which we know is the best receiving core in the country, but like, come on. He was ridiculous. He was ridiculous. So I give it to him. CD gave it to uh, Kane Prescorn. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, if you're watching on YouTube real quick, by the way, quick reminder to subscribe and like the video if you haven't already done so. But look at that guy. That's the oldest player in the background there that is making one hand catch. And that was not his only one. And they were toe tap catches for third downs, keeping drives alive. It was really awesome. We've talked about him early in the year. We, we wanted to see him get healthy. He's a transfer that came in from the American Conference, I believe, Memphis, right? If I, if I yep. if I'm wrong. But yeah, he is a guy that the staff was super high on about. And they would have loved to use him and Michael Trigg as a two tight end set. Michael Trigg obviously didn't, didn't work out. Hopefully he figures everything else out with, with, with what's going on with him. But pre scoring 10 receptions, 136 yards, two touchdowns. I mentioned the multiple one handed catch. He was awesome. He, he was a physical freak. And I, I Trey Harris could have given him too in that game. But the goal against a really good front seven and, and linebacker core. Obviously, I know, uh, I believe Ab- Ab- Abdul Carter, it, it was him that got hurt, um, which is obviously a huge blow for them. And say he rolled his ankle was, was not super healthy, but yeah, I thought he was really special against a pretty damn talented team. I know their corners were out, but safeties and linebackers were matched up on him, and he was just everywhere Shredding. when they needed Redding. him. He, he, would, and, he was a monster, he was a monster. It, it, it's deserved. There were a couple other, other honorable mentions that we had. Uh, Freddie Brock, uh, you can see him up there in, in the video if you're watching Georgia, or sorry, if you're watching via YouTube, Georgia State running back, uh, originally from Maine. Yeah, he was not the starter because Marcus Carroll and he dominated. Marcus Carroll dominated all year, transferring to Missouri. Freddie Brock got the the call and uh, well, he absolutely blurred. He's over two hundred yards that game. He was a monster. And also another uh, honorable mention, like before, Jason Bean. So, congrats to those two for getting honorable mention, <laughs> offensive for best offensive performance, Richard sophomore awards. CD, I'll let you take away best performance defense. Yeah, I think we both agreed on this one. It was the stud from Texas State himself, Brian Holloway. Four tackle, tackles, not super impressive, but the super impressive part was the two pick sixes that came in big-time situations for them. Just when he thought Rice was going to be able to make it a game, Brian Holloway comes away and with the second pick six of the day. And, and it was it was awesome. It, it was really cool to see them see that happen. It was Again, it was a game, I believe it was, what, the Tuesday night, right for them there. It was the, the Tuesday after Christmas. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was awesome. I'm yeah. very happy for for them. And you saw how excited Texas State was to win that game after the pick sixes. They're all celebrating. It, it was it was awesome. He he played his heart 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 out for sure. Yeah, as a Texas State better, I'm grateful to Brian Holloway. Honorable mentions though, Bo Richter for Air Force three sacks, <laughs> one half tackles for loss, and a forced fumble. Yeesh. Another one, Jack Sawyer three sacks. Uh, yeah, if there are any other ones that you guys uh thinking about. I uh, also thought about putting I, I thought about putting Kobe Bryant, but like he just had one pick. There, were, I don't know. There were a lot of, there were a lot of really really good performances in these bowl games. I thought about putting Sam Matthews up there, interception and double digit tackles, former walk on for Texas A and M. He was up there, so th- there were a lot of really good defensive players. But I will settle on Brian Holloway. Congratulations to you. Biggest surprise, upset game, whatever. We just had to go with an upset. Uh, the biggest surprise to me was, and to you, Coastal Carolina mm-hmm. taking it to San Jose State, who had been one of the hottest teams in the entire country. They go in there with Ethan Vasco, which we know, which, by the way, on this show, we were we were high on Ethan Vasco. Wow. We were high on him, right? Like, normal, your casual gambler is going to look at third-string quarterback. Well, let me hammer San Jose State. We were on San Jose State because they were just good, right? We knew Ethan Vasco was really good. He had won ball games for them before. He was a guy that Lance Leipold had wanted at Kansas. And if Lance Leipold wants him, then I want him, right? That, that, that's the point. So he was a Virginia high school player of the year. He was a stud. But, yeah, this this just shocked me. This was like a 10-point spread that moved Dolly down to 7.5. I was confused by that movement. If that had touched 7, I would have probably added it on Dawson's Diner, San Jose State, but it didn't. And, thankfully, I didn't. it didn't because <laughs> – uh, Coastal Carolina won straight up twenty four to fourteen, yeah. And that game, uh, 
Kerry Robinson was absolutely shut down, which we did not think was going to happen. And Ethan Vasco did enough. Not not saying Ethan Vasco did an amazing game, but he did enough. Well, and he got some on his on his on the ground as well. We knew Sam Pickney was a stud. He was eight for 123 in a touchdown. I thought the reason why I was also nervous was no Jared Brown. Jared Brown's a stud for them. That second option there they have really compliments Sam Pickney very, very nicely. He'll be an NFL guy as well one day. And yeah, we, we were expecting how hot San Jose State was down the stretch, how they were upset. They didn't get to play in the Mountain West Championship. And Coastal Carolina team that we we like them a lot. We like their program. We like their culture. But we were really expecting San Jose State to go into Hawaii and, and really get it done there and cover a pretty hefty line. And the, they lost by double digits there. And it was not particularly close, to be honest, either. All right. Moving on. Congratulations to Coastal Carolina, by the way, for being our biggest surprise because we thought you were not going to do well, and you did. Awesome. Uh, I know we got some Coastal Carolina fans out there that are following our show, so thank you so much to you guys. Best performance in a loss. I'll let you take that one away. Uh, best performance in a loss. Oh, sorry, know. sorry. First, first time starter. First time award. starter award. We'll get the best performance in a loss after. We'll go in a surprise, a little bit of a surprise, a guy that's been pretty – kind of overshadowed, right, because of who else was in his quarterback room. We're going to go oh, all the way out to USC. This is Miller Moss, right? He dominated a Louisville team that had a pretty respectable defense all throughout. This was in the Direct TV Holiday Bowl back on December 27th. He had 327, 372 yards, six touchdowns, only one interception. He was awesome and really solidified that quarterback position for the future there. For USC, and now they're out on Will Howard, apparently. Okay, now Malachi it's... Nelson's in the portal, and, and he's the guy there all of a sudden, the, the last man remaining, and he has been a stud. Yeah, if you're going to cause Will Howard to start taking visits at Ohio State, and you all of a sudden cause Malachi Nelson to go into the transfer portal, you're going to win that award for me. That was a absolutely amazing performance. Honorable mentions will go to Garrett Nussmeyer, for sure, at LSU. Steve Angeli at Notre Dame. I thought he played really well that game. And Caden Veltkamp who didn't start, but he should have. That's what, <laughs> If he was a starter, I probably would have put him on this list for that comeback win, but he didn't actually start, so he couldn't actually receive this award. That guy's a stud. But yeah, Miller Moss, it makes you feel a lot better about USC's program going forward because you're like, you know, this team that won, what, eight games or seven games with Caleb Williams at quarterback? You're like, what do they do? What do they do? And now all of a sudden you got, <laughs> you got NFL draft newbie guys like, questioning Caleb Williams' yeah. ability because he's a system quarterback, apparently. Yeah, let, okay. No. Let's not no. Let's not do that game. This right? is about Miller Moss. Miller Moss hype, not about Caleb Williams' slander. No, yes. Miller Moss was awesome. And they also had some opt-outs. They had some wide receivers missing, the running back missing, couple out, couple old linemen. It was really impressive. And the best part about it is you don't have to use your NIL to go get a quarterback now. You can go and beef up the defense, beef up the trenches, and really go and compete year one in the big time. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I love that. Let's move on. Let's go to best performance in a loss. I'll say it right away. We both agreed on this. Rocco Beck. Are you kidding Free me? Free my boy Rocco. Your, your team has zero yards rushing. Now, some of that was due to his sack, <laughs> lo- sack yardage he loss. He can't do everything. Though. He can't do everything. What do you think? Over 400 yards, three touchdowns or something like that? Yep, 446 and, 446 three, and three tutters. Get the man some freaking help. He also ran the ball. 12 times, your running back had 0.3 yards per carry. This is a guy that had over 200 yards against Kansas State literally a month ago. I'll ask the, the audience. Last game. I'll ask the audience. Over, under, a half a yard rushing for this team. I'll give you five seconds to answer this in the comments. Over, under, a half a yard rushing. Yeah, the under. That would be the under. They had zero yards rushing. Zero. And what are you supposed to do? Rocco back. What are you supposed to end your defense? Is just getting shredded by Seth Hennigan, Blake Watson, and Co. I'm sorry, dude. You you balled out, man. And I, I love the way that you played this year. I'm excited to see you play next year as well. You went down early. I was 19, I think, whatever, but you fought back. You had a chance. Yeah. You cut it to nine at halftime. And then you went out and you, you your defense just could not get you any stops when they needed to in that third quarter. And, and you had no chance to. 446 yards. Yeah. Honorable Ooh. mention, though, Corey Rucker, over 100 yards. And his first two touchdowns of the season came in the Camellia Bowl against Northern Illinois. Uh, he was uh, He's a wide receiver for Arkansas State. Probably one of their best receivers. Just, it was, I found it shocking that he hadn't scored a touchdown all year. He yeah. Scored two of them. He's a former South SEC guy right in South Carolina. Yeah. Something like that. Very top um, player. And then George Hawani. Also was very, very good. Had over 180 total yards and two touchdowns. Is that a swan song? Is he done with eligibility? I believe he 
Yeah, he's been there he's forever, been there so but also he's had so many injuries. Let me double check that real quick. Yeah, but I, I thought he was really good in that game as well. He busted off a gigantic touchdown. Um, I think I took his under for that game too, rushing yards, and that run put it over. So tough, tough, tough way to go. But thank you for your service, George Alani. You've been incredible. He's what? That's his fifth year. I, I think that's it. I think that is his fourth year. He's he's played four years of actual football. Who knows with COVID? Well, hopefully we we'll see him back next year. But Ashton uh, Gantz there; they'll be okay. But yeah, I have no idea. He deserves a shout out for sure. Very good. And then I'll let you take the. Do we do we officially confirm what the last one was? Yeah. Okay. That's Coach and John. Yeah, we 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 went back and forth uh, about this, but I think we deg- agreed upon one winner. Even though there were a lot of winners, including the coaches in the college football playoff games, but we thought there was one particular coach that kind of. Uh, Stood out from the rest, and I'm sure you guys are going to disagree. So let us know who we missed in the comments if you don't feel the same. Yeah, we're going to take our way to the famous, right? Not the famous toastery, but the famous Pop Tarts Bowl. This was best mascot, best entrance, yada, yada, yada. It was best trophy. It was awesome. It was also a very good game played, right? This is Kansas State's Chris Climbing. It's going to get our best coaching job performance. I thought what he did without his OC. With a bunch of players in the portal, with a brand new quarterback coming in, true freshman, who I know you're very high on, and there's a reason why he's there and Will Howard's not. He made it look easy. He made it look really easy. While he wasn't totally in, a, in a, totally efficient at times, but you also see just how effortlessly he runs the football. Avery Johnson there for Kansas State. You shut down a really good fo- football team. I like North Carolina State was a really good team in the ACC. They were nine and three. They played really well, especially down the stretch there. Brendan Armstrong was figuring it out. He ran for over 120 yards, and you still won by over a touchdown. Hats off to you in Kansas State. Absolutely. And uh, there were a lot of other coaches out there that probably deserve we'll, we'll throw out a couple honorable mentions, and there's going to be more because there were a lot of really good coaching jobs. And you, you got to understand, this is all going on, transfer portal, right? You got that early, early signing day going on. Like, these coaches are doing it all. So I, I thought Chris Kleiman just – deserve a special shout out for all the reasons that Sadie said, but uh, Ryan Silverfield's going to get an honorable mention for me because of the way that he handled Iowa State and the way that he got his team ready to play in that ball game. They absolutely shredded Iowa State and defensively they came up with stops when they needed to. So uh, shout out to Ryan Silverfield from Memphis. I thought you did a fantastic job. There are other coaches, obviously Lane Kiffin with his performance against Penn State with the opt outs though, you know, some things are skewed a little bit. Of course, Jim Harbaugh figuring his stuff out. His staff absolutely played out of his mind. We'll talk some more about Jim Harbaugh in a little bit. Uh, the last one that some of you are probably gonna be like, "What? Why won't you give it to? Why won't you give it to Tyson Health? You know, he came back in the famous Toaster Bowl. Here's why I will not give it to Tyson Helton of Western Kentucky. We saw Caden Veltkamp, who was getting reps at tight end, by the way, or whatever he was told to play tight end, or getting reps, whatever the story was. I can't confirm all the details of it. But you're telling me that he was going to start his nephew, right? If you didn't know, Tyson Helton is Clay Helton's brother. Clay Helton, former USC coach, coach at Georgia Southern. His kid, Turner, he's like, let me go start my nephew, right? Pull up, pull, pull Mike Gundy for a second. Let me start my nephew over this other quarterback that very clearly is more ready to play and is just better. That's what I'm going to do. And then he waited and it almost cost his team a loss. Thank God Caden Veltkamp exists and is as good as he is to pull him, pull him out of the mud right there. So Tyson Heldon, you will not be getting this award because of mishandling the quarter acquisition before you put in Caden Veltkamp. Is that fair? That's very fair. Real quick, I, I, while we're while we're slandering the coach, why not? I'm gonna throw another category. I didn't really talk to you about it, but I just thought about yeah. it. We're gonna talk about most disappointing coaching job because I thought right. there are a couple of them. There, there are a couple. He's off the rip here, no prep done. I'm gonna throw a few names here. Tell me if you agree or not. We're gonna go to Miami, right? Mario Cristobal. Oh. To lose to Rutgers, right? Rutgers was not a very good football team in the Big Ten. And you, you were lost. winning in the fourth quarter. Yep. And you blow that. I get it. It was weird weather conditions in the football field. Yada yada yada. Let's go all the way back to the first game. Everyone's favorite Myrtle Beach Ball and <laughs> Clay. Freaking hell. The Heltons. Just coming out super flat. Unbelievably disappointing for that for that team and for that roster. Another one here. Let's go to Auburn and Hugh Freeze. You mentioned it earlier with them losing. That was unbelievably ugly after scheming up so much against Alabama and throw another dud here against a team. 
that you probably should have beaten. Super unfortunate. And I'll throw you one in a win here. Let's go LSU's defensive staff, which has just been canned effectively. <laughs> Hopefully those guys find their jobs. I hate to add insult to injury there, but I, well, here, I'll, to help your point, I'll say this. What did I always say about Tanner Mordecai? He's good against group of five teams. He's good against group of five teams. Good against group of five defenses, that is. And they just played one in the secondary there. And he was very, very good. So, yeah, it, it, it was tough there. But obviously, I figured we, we should bring some teams down to earth because we, we've been propping up a lot of teams in this award section and a lot of players. Deservingly so. There's a lot of highlights that we love to talk about. Let us know if we missed any, obviously. But I thought it'd be fun to add in a couple jabs there with some coaching staffs that – I mean, that's the thing with both seasons. Like, who, which coaching staff actually care? And Clay Helton did not, right? Hugh Freeze did not. Mario Cristobal did not. And and some others too as well, but we don't, we don't have Mac to. Mac Brown apparently doesn't. <laughs> Just fired Gene Chizik. Finally. Okay, at least he's kind of getting serious about it. You know, at least he's, he's finally yeah. getting a little bit serious about it. Of course, after the transport window, you know, just like all these sneaky sons of goat guns. You know what? I'm watching all of you coaches that fire your staffs. When you fire a staff member, an important staff member, the day after the transfer portal closes, I think you're an asshole. Here's why. You're not letting kids transfer when they, when they need to. You're not giving them enough time. That sucks. That sucks. I'm looking at you, Brian Kelly. I'm looking at you, Brian Kelly. I'm looking at you, Mac Brown. That That's a D-bag move if I've ever seen one. So that's just my opinion. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's ex- extra circumstances. Like if your coaching staffs get fired, you can enter the transfer portal when it's not the window. I don't know if that works. Either way, I think you're a bottle. You get, a, you, get you get kids that just signed. Dominique McKinley just signed to LSU. That defensive staff that just flipped. <laughs> well, yeah, he just flipped from a particular team. We're not gonna be upset about it. What I am upset about is poor Dom McKinley. Now he's going into a staff that he does, he has no idea what he's getting himself into. And he just signed his national letter of intent. So yeah, what are you gonna do? Actually, I don't know if he officially signed, but he flipped for sure. But uh, yeah, well, let's let's get out of these. Thank you for joining us for awards. If you're still this far into it, please consider liking and subscribing. We love you guys.